Hey out there survivors and welcome back to another episode of Let's Survive Interviews. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a guy who I first met around about 10 years ago uh, back when I was a developer and he was a journalist in the gaming industry. Since then he's gone on to be the European Creative Director at Riot Games and at the moment he is now transitioned and is the founder and uh, Creative Director at Tune and Fairweather Publishing. Mr. Jason Killingsworth, it's great to have you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks for having me. Dude, I, I, I wanted any excuse just to catch up and chat. If be, it's so funny because when we first met, we were living in entirely different countries. Now we live in the same country. And I said it to my wife earlier. I was like, I realized that I've seen Jason less since we live in the same country. I know, and we don't have t uh, 10 years or six years of COVID-19 to blame for it. <laughs> like, well, Very it's okay. True. You know, we've been, we've been strapped, you know, to our... Uh, in living room couches or something but uh, <laughs> no, it's great it's great to have an excuse i was thrilled when you when you reached out and and i would have been happy to catch up whether there were uh, you know microphones recording or not like because it's always a pleasure to to chat with you i mean i think we were in uh in bath in it the uk in bath. yeah because i had to get a time a train, we sat down i had to get a train from brighton i was at develop and i got a train to london then a train to bath and uh, yeah, I remember me and you chilling out playing Spelunky. That's what I remember most about yeah. that trip. <laughs> I think most of my time living in the UK working for Edge magazine was playing Spelunky. They actually put it on my on my leaving cover. No way! Uh, That's got, amazing. I've got on the shelf uh, somewhere, but it says there's a little badge uh, on the magazine, the fake magazine cover, and it just says Spelunky, Spelunky, Spelunky. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I just remember sucking at it so badly. And you were like, no, you'll get better. It's fine. It's fine. I, I never got better. Just the heads up, Jason. I never got I, good. I think that's that's almost like the perfect uh, segue into this <laughs> conversation because I think the game that I've been preoccupied with for a lot of my former uh, career as a journalist and, and now it's sort of bleeding into my uh, experiments in book publishing. Uh, our first title is about Dark Souls. So... Yes, uh, I think there's there's definitely a crossover there. I mean, it definitely strikes me that uh, yeah, you you like the hard stuff. You like the hard stuff, good sir. And it's I do not mean like alcohol. some people I'm like not uh, that you're not loggers. I'm like, just can you give me the 200 proof uh, <laughs> whiskey <laughs> off the the very top shelf that like killed the last guy who drank it? Can I have can I have that stuff? Because it's got skull and crossbones all over the uh, the label. That looks delicious. Let's have let's have a big just a pint glass of that. Actually, not even a, not even a highball. Let's just uh, <laughs> get it all into our system. the whole bottle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, just I guess um, I have a question that I usually ask people, which is like, what's the first kind of horror game you remember playing? But I'm gonna kind of mix that up here because I want to ask like, have you always been into like difficult, challenging games? Like, has that always been a facet of like? your interest in video games it has i i always loved the like the mechanical challenge uh, i have this memory going back to when i was i was probably eight nine years old uh somewhere like between eight and ten uh in my neighborhood we had just left ireland uh to move to southern california because i grew up in dublin but but then my my parents who are originally from the states they moved the family to uh, between LA and San Diego, kind of okay, in that area, yeah. and I remember I was I was obsessed with with Nintendo, with the original Nintendo Entertainment System, which is where I date myself. You know, this was <laughs> sort of late '80s, <laughs> some, somewhere in there. We'll just we'll leave it a little bit vague, but uh, I remember some of the really brutal, like early Nintendo games. Uh, I'm thinking of Bionic Commando oh, wow, yeah. and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where you have to like swim through these, like uh, you know, these mines, these like electrical mines, and uh, I, these were just some of the most brutal, unforgiving games. And I remember at one point getting uh, somebody ringing me on the phone and and saying, "Hey, I've got some some friends like over visiting, and I want to show them this." level towards the or like i want to show them the end of uh teenage mutant ninja turtles can you come up to my house and complete the game so that they can see the end of it and so i went up there and then you know an hour hour and a half later i'd you know beaten the game and and they're like oh that was cool and then i left like literally i was like some sort of uh like video game call boy or something like you just i don't know if that's uh, i'm gonna get canceled for uh 
for, for that. But um, I don't think so. I think you're safe. Um, but yeah, I just got like I was like the the fixer to come in and 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 complete this hard game. And I remember the same thing happening with uh, with Bionic Commando. Somebody yeah. like he was playing with a friend. He's like, hey, we can't get past this level. Can you can you come up to my house and help us get past this level? And I went in and and I, I remember they were like really thankful like oh thanks so much that was that level was doing our heads in and that is although they wouldn't have used like an irish expression for it like it would have that that sucked bro or you know whatever whatever it was uh yeah. but, no oh, so yeah. yeah i've always kind of had a thing for these games i've always loved like a real challenge and something that you had to actually practice yeah uh, in order to to get to deconstruct and to get your fingers around like it's it's funny because I would definitely if you had been living locally to me I would have been calling you because there's two Naze games that it's haunted me uh, for so long that I've, I could just go on YouTube and watch a Let's Play but it would it would destroy me. Um, I one is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There was a part where you had to jump across a little gap and the the hole was like tiny, but you had to like get across that. there. Yep. And it, I couldn't get past that part and it drove me insane. Um, that and Zelda too. Uh, Zelda 2 I found obnoxiously hard as well. Zelda 2, yeah, I know that that had some uh, that had some pretty sadistic parts in it for sure. <laughs> and it was like I loved the first game. I didn't actually own um an an NES. Uh, my best friend mm -hmm. did, and I'd go to his house and play it. And I I played Legend of Zelda one. It was challenging, but we got through it. And then he was like, "Dude, I got Zelda 2. and I was like, "Oh my god!" And went to his ah. house, and we're like two hours into it, like. This is really, really fucking hard. <laughs> you're still in the two hours later. You're still in the room where Zelda is sleeping, and you're like, how do we get out of this room? <laughs> you could have, you could have rang me, and I could have told you to walk to the right uh, or the left, uh, uh, but I wasn't there um, at the time. That's what we were missing. Um, no, it's funny because I. It's weird that there's a subset of these types of games that I absolutely love. Right, I'm a gigantic fan of the Mega Man series, which are known to be oh, God, the yeah, older yeah, yeah. ones particularly hard and like that i love the challenge even the castlevania games are another one that are, are bastard hard but i but what's weird yeah. is um the game that we're going to be talking probably majority about today which is dark souls which you've literally wrote the book on um like that game and me have a complicated history which we'll get to uh it, it actually begins with demon souls i can't say it begins at dark souls yeah uh, it begins all the way back on the ps3 with demon souls and basically I had everyone around me tell me, dude, well, all my friends who would be big nerds, uh, dude, you got to play this game, Demon Souls. I think at the time we had to import it from the US. Yeah, I was still you like, I was going to say you're, you were really early to the party because a lot <laughs> of people totally missed Demon Souls, had no yeah. idea it even existed because it was such a cult, like it had this cult following and you had to import it from, from the uh, well, from Japan originally, but then from the States yeah. because it didn't have a European distribution uh, at the start. And, and that's what I did because I was... I had just moved back to Dublin. Um, it was 2009. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so a friend of mine had imported it from the US and loaned me his copy. So that was that was how I got to play it for the first time. I, I, I basically, my, my, one of my best friends, the same guy who owns Zelda 2, funnily enough, said like, uh, oh, my, my brother bought this game from the US. He says it's amazing. We got to check it out. And I, I played like, I don't know, an hour of it. And I was like, Oh, fuck this game man like I was like <laughs> I was so broken and then to kind of jump ahead right I kind of I never got I couldn't I it was too hard for me and when Dark Souls came out someone said to me I know you weren't a huge fan of Demon Souls right but Dark Souls is a lot easier and I went okay I, I'll definitely check it out because I liked a lot of things about Demon Souls so I I picked it up a special collector's edition I was all hyped and I was like this nice. is fucking hard man this is still hard <laughs> um, so I should I should throw out a little spoiler is that with with our book uh, you died uh, that Keza McDonald and I wrote when you're turning the pages little knives like shoot out from between the pages <laughs> and we'll like we'll cut your uh, carotid artery if you don't turn the pages uh, just the just this voice. exact uh, way so yeah so just a word of caution to to viewers if they pick up the book great way to though, to talk about this i mean yeah as i said you've literally wrote the book on this game so i'd love to, to hear you talk a little bit about you died and what it encompasses and what people can kind of expect to get from it other than knives in their neck um <laughs> <laughs> usually yeah they're 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 mostly virtual thankfully but uh <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, like we talked a little bit earlier about the idea of there is a certain tribe of of gamers who they they really want that challenge. They they feel a little bit insulted if the game is spoon feeding hints to them. I, I absolutely adore the Naughty Dog games, and I one of my favorite reviews that I got to write uh, while I was at Edge was the the review of The Last of Us. That was oh, one wow, of yeah. The last things I did, you know, before leaving the magazine, uh, but it wasn't so much in The Last of Us, but in, uh, in in some of the Uncharted games, if you were taking too long to complete a puzzle, yeah. it would say like one of like Sully or somebody would say, "Hey Drake, did you think about like hanging on that you know clock arm for three <laughs> seconds and then dropping down and then moving this block two spaces over?" <laughs> and and I sometimes I would be sorting out the puzzle and you know I'm. I tend to be very methodical and so it takes me a little like I I can figure it out eventually but it'll usually take me a little while to uh, to just kind of put the pieces together and uh, and so there were so many times where I was enjoying figuring out the puzzle I'm looking in my journal and then all of a sudden the puzzle gets ruined for me by <laughs> like you know Joe NPC over here <laughs> backseat gamer I, just, I, I know but and I totally I I mean I've you know, played games and yeah. written about them and studied the craft of designing them. And I know why they do it because like you said, it feels really bad when you get stuck in a game. And so they're play testing these things. And clearly, you know, some significant number of people who were coming into the play test lab just got stuck and lost interest in the game at that particular point. And so they don't want people to quit playing the game because of that puzzle and so they just included they felt like they were doing um some large percentage of players a favor by just like helping them through over that you know little hump yeah uh but dark souls you know, spoiler <laughs> alert and you knew this was coming uh it does not give you that that comforting hand up uh it's just like Hey, you know, pal, let me uh, you know, let me help you across this no. this ledge. It it just kind of pushes you over the ledge. It's like <laughs> you, you did wrong there. <laughs> it doesn't even give that, but it allows you to. It's very much the the tough love kind of parent. It's mm. not a a helicopter parent who's like helping you up in the adventure playground. It's you know it's... onto the bars. It just lets you figure out and make the mistakes for yourself. And I kind of like. I feel really chuffed when a game respects my abilities that much it's like i know you can do this just figure it out like here just beat your you might have to beat your head against uh, you know this enemy <laughs> for a while but but you'll get it and you i, I really love games that respect you know the ability of players in that way yeah. now this is where i'm going to kind of jump around a little bit right i as i say i struggled with demon souls i struggled with dark souls i had to review dark souls 2 back when i was a journalist myself and I struggled with that because I had to beat it because I had to review it. So that was a challenge. But I started to gain a little more. I started to enjoy a little more when I was playing Dark Souls 2. And then I personally like adored Bloodborne. But I think that's because Bloodborne is oh totally my, God, yeah. my jam. Totally my aesthetic. It's a ho it's horror. It feels like everything is, about yeah. horror. 100%. Um, but, and what's interesting is a friend of mine on the Twitch streams that I do you can choose to pick what game I play next. And he picked Dark Souls. And I was like, oh, Christ, no. Like, I remember this game just beating the shit out of me over yeah. and over. And what's interesting is I've gone back and I'm replaying it to kind of build myself up for the stream. I was like, I'm not jumping in cold on the stream. I need to get some practice in here, bro. Um, this is like, yeah, doing a few crunches <laughs> before you before you go to the beach. Just get, you know, <laughs> so you don't, you know, have the dad bod, like, to... Uh, <laughs> I'm not pleased. Nobody think that this is something I do. <laughs> I'm proud of. I'm proud of my dad, Bob. But yeah, same, same all the way. Um, no, yeah. but I. Uh, what's interesting is eight years removed from the game's release and the hype of it, and the people telling me why don't you like it? You know, I remember when this came out, and I said like I wasn't a huge fan. There was so many people that were like, it became very much a pop culture for or pop for not cultural phenomenon that I felt like yeah, I was like the definitely. outsider for not really liking it. Whereas eight years removed, I'm now replaying it and I'm like, all the things I loved about something like Breath of the Wild are here in this game. Like, yeah. as you say, it doesn't go, hey, see that big glowing spot over there? That's where you're going. It's like, you go one way, 
there's something that kills you mercilessly and you go, maybe I should try the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Even yeah. that is like a pro Dark Souls strat because <laughs> some people just lose all, I think once you get a, that first punch in the face, they get just a little bit like shell shocked and they just keep trying the same oh, no. <laughs> way over because they lose. When you, when you have a sense of danger, there is this evolutionary uh, kind of uh, adaptation as Homo sapiens where the range of options shrinks down to to that fight or flight kind of response mm. and we we lose our problem solving ability because the brain almost like shuts off every single fa mental faculty that's not you know going to help it survive in, in moment, that moment yeah. <laughs> yeah so it does it does give you that that feeling of incredible threat uh, right away and then you get to decide um, whether you're going to kind of exhale, self-regulate emotionally, <laughs> and then take a like approach those challenges with a slightly cooler head. I, I do think that if I didn't, I, I often wonder, right? If I didn't get so into Bloodborne, and Bloodborne was definitely, I've, I've heard a lot of people who are big fans of the series say that Bloodborne is definitely easier because you have the dodge mechanic or, well, like, that's the way I've heard it described is that there are elements of Bloodborne that are definitely more accessible than the soul than the souls games. Um, mm. You can get I, a little bit of health back if you, yeah, like if you're able to retaliate. Um, yes, with a yeah. few blows. So some of those things do make it a little bit more forgiving. Like it almost feels like a, a slightly more uh, mechanically intricate Devil May Cry game or something. Is you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's almost what Bloodborne feels like. And for me, I think that's helped me with going back to Dark Souls because it was yeah. like somebody go it's yeah it's it's like getting a taste of something and going like this is this is tough but I can do it and then you do it and you're like okay I've that done now what's the next level for me so I feel like that was maybe the right order for me to play these games in was to go back to or play Bloodborne go back to Dark Souls yeah. and now play Demon Souls when it comes out on PS4 Well you know you mentioned your friend who who was telling you that Dark Souls was a little bit easier than Demon Souls. Yes. And I I don't I immediately I was like is that true? Is it easier? But one one thing my brain kind of went to was it might not be easier, but if you've played through Demon Souls then you've gotten very accustomed to yes. the way the game plays and those skills I, as any fan of the Soulsborne series and or Sekiro even yes yeah, those skills translate and you carry those skills forward so you know to be a little bit more patient to like check out your behaviors or yeah. check out the enemy's behavior set um you know choose your moment to get a blow don't get too greedy by trying to get in too many blows before you roll out of the way or figure out your evasive strategy and and so your friend clearly got pretty good you know well very good if you completed demon souls so yeah. when he went into dark souls i'm sure he was thinking like gosh this is a lot easier than demon souls but he had actually just just beefed up good. he's gotten good or <laughs> get gooded or you know whatever um and i mean past tenses i mean uh something that like something that fascinates me about dark souls is like are the well the souls games in general is that they've created a new subgenre of sorts like you hear people now talk about souls likes like you know oh this is a yeah. souls like and i just i'm trying to think of any other game in the last like you know 15 years that has really done that like re like the last one that is springs to mind for me is like castlevania the symphony of the night with a metroidvania is like the last i was I thinking metro I, th I thought of metroidvania as well that was yeah. the only the only um, thing i could think of like that but I mean, like roguelike goes back to the eighties and that, that's obviously had a resurgence in the last 10 years. And the Souls games have elements of those kind of roguelike, but they're not quite as punishing. Um, they're yeah. very, very punishing, but they're not, they're not that punishing. I mean, people right? like streamers play them like roguelikes. Yes. Like, streamers doing no hit runs is essentially just turning, playing Souls uh, in, you know, as, as a roguelike. It's, um, it's but crazy, but it blows my mind. It blows my mind seeing, um, as I say, uh, I think it was, I mean, is there any kind of souls likes that you've seen that really stand out um, to you as a fan of the series, as a fan of the franchise? Uh, enough of a fan to have written a pretty hefty tome about it, co-written a pretty <laughs> hefty tome about it. <laughs> 
it's it's interesting because I, I feel like each Souls like that I play has some element. It has some that spark of genius in Dark Souls. It holds up a mirror and reflects some element of, of Dark Souls that I really love. Mm. And I appreciate seeing that glimmer, like, wow, oh, they captured this really well. But the the difficulty of paying homage to a series as masterfully done as as you know the Souls games, uh, even even though it's not a it's not a perfect <laughs> you know, it's not a perfect. I mean, D Dark Souls the first one feels perfect to me. Yes. Uh, but you know, as you go through the series, you start to get a little bit like, oh, that wasn't exactly right. And uh, Dark Souls two has a number of issues and and these things, but it's such a difficult formula to emulate because it's it's so multi-layered um there are things i've loved about all of the those games that are that uh, are paying homage to dark souls um like on the indie side of things i i thought titan souls oh yeah like was it was really endearing and i i loved the way that it reflected some of those feelings like boss you know those boss encounters and trying to figure out the puzzle um Obviously, Dark Souls draws a huge amount from Zelda. Yes. When I was interviewing Miyazaki, he he mentioned, um, like he pointed to Link to the Past as being his f favorite game of all time. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and, uh, now that you say yeah. that, that really expands a lot of my thoughts. And as I say, now in a post Breath of the Wild world, which is to me, Breath of the Wild went back to finding what was so good about the Legend of Zelda on the on the NES, um, mm. and now looking at Dark Souls, having played Breath of the Wild, it's completely recolored my view of the game because I'm like, oh no, wait, this is all the fundamentals of what I love. Even about stuff like Ocarina of Time with Z targeting and figuring out your like moments to strike and when not to strike and using a shield. It's now that you say it, it's like my brain is exploding. It's like, dude, it's basically a slight, it's basically a harder Ocarina of Time. Wow. <laughs> That's uh there is a chapter in in You Died. I think it was the uh the Tour of Lordran chapter with it, which are these interstitial chapters that we initially I wrote it as one just completely indigestible mega chapter. It was <laughs> a seventeen thousand word it was going to be a single chapter, and then uh my co-author Keza had the um, the the good grace to suggest that like maybe we should chop that up by area and then we can put them in between the other chapters uh, rather than chopping two thirds of the words to you know get it down to yeah. a single reasonable chapter length. But in the uh, chapter on the Ula Seal kind of stages and and some of those DLC parts, uh, it plays Dark Souls plays with with the passage of time in that because you see some of the areas you've already visited in a former age mm. and and so that's been really magnificently uh, that kind of technique has you get a master class in that playing uh, you know some of the the, Zelda games. You know, the first 3d yeah Zelda games like Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask and you get interesting like playing with time especially in yeah you know, Ocar yeah, in, uh, in Ocarina of Time and and so I, I talk about the connections to Zelda and how I I think I, I compare the analogy I use from Zelda to Dark or Ocarina of Time to Dark Souls as being the equivalent of like the Christopher Nolan uh, Batman remake of the old slightly cheesier uh, Michael Keaton Batman <laughs> movies, which were much more they were sort of cartoony and sort of yeah. and a lot of it was played for laughs, laughs whereas you know, Christopher Nolan just threw threw a bunch of grit and <laughs> and grime and this this layer of of realism on on top of it and so I felt like Dark Souls was sort of the Zelda for mature audiences yes. or in the case of Miyazaki a Zelda fanboy who grew up and also read a lot of British fantasy like the fighting fantasy series and then wanted to bring that sense of that the slightly uh, horror and and, yes. and grotesquery of like some of that of that Game of Thrones comes from that same tradition of you know, dark fantasy. guts kind of fantasy, dark yeah. fantasy, yeah. But even Britain like dark, whatever uh, you want to call it. Yeah, like I mean, even when you look at kind of Germanic folklore in general, like uh, it the Germanic kind of medieval feudal stuff, 
it is a lot of that kind of like really i mean and again uh, it's not it's not japan's first rodeo with that kind of imagery because like the berserk series dwells Absolutely. on that that huge influence yeah oh definitely it's written all over which is why it shocked me that i couldn't get into it at the time because again i love the berserk series so i was like dude this is everything you should like i was not <laughs> i think i was more angry patty at you should have <laughs> rang me i would have come to your house <laughs> i just need you to beat this dude uh no i I, sh I felt like i was more angry at myself i was more like why don't you like it like this should be everything mm. you like like you will sit there for two and a half hours on a stupid Mega Man boss, but you're getting annoyed, hmm. you know. And like, as I say, but sometimes I think there are these experiences that you have to remove yourself from and add some more context into your life in other ways to then come back That's and go, ah, oh. I mean, it happened to me with Resident Evil 2. It happened to me with Silent Hill 2. These are two games that I was not a gigantic lover of when they first released, which blows people's minds, blew my mind at the time, because everyone's like, dude, Silent Hill 2 is the best horror game ever made. At the time I was like, I don't know, I prefer the first. Now, ten, yeah, yeah. 10 years after playing Silent Hill 2, I went back and replayed it and was like, dude, this is a fucking masterpiece. What was wrong with me? I'm an idiot. <laughs> Do you know that phrase, when the when the student is ready, the master will appear? Uh -huh. like, there's <laughs> yes. that, that old, I think it's a samurai, um, a bit of samurai wisdom. Yeah. Uh, that c context matters a lot. Yes. And it matters in the way that we connect to you know, to other people, to um, to art, you know, to a certain yeah. book. Uh, I know, like my wife and I, we knew each other for years before we ever had a romantic relationship. And yeah. uh, there was a certain point where we had known each other so long that, like, sometimes I would think just because we were really good friends, I was like, yeah, well, what if you know, yeah. Summer and I ended up, you know, together at some point? And then I was just like, gosh, she's like. A sister you know we've we've been friends for so long and there was there wasn't that the chemistry or that that romantic spark but then we both kind of went our separate ways and then we met back up at a concert just randomly oh, wow. like in a different city she had, had uh, come up for you know some job interviews and and then a band we both loved was playing while she was there and and we bumped into each other at the concert and there was something about meeting in a different yes. place where it was like we were meeting each other for the first time and we didn't uh, have all of the previous history of you know, knowing each other in high school and then yeah. going to the same university. And then it, the spark ignited. And so I feel like that's just like a relational example of what can happen with, with art and even yeah. really amazing art. Cause she didn't change. Like she was yeah, still yeah. like a really interesting, cool, beautiful person. Uh, but it was the context that changed, and then and then that was the right uh, environment in which yeah. for that connection to yeah to happen. I love that. That's such a beautiful story, and it is definitely it is something that I find that like, um, it's why I've always found the job of criticism and critique very difficult because and this will actually lead back nicely to talking a little bit about your past work at Edge, but um, like I've always found critique and criticism difficult because you might say I mean Roger Ebert I believe it was hated Alien when it came out. And then, right. you know, 20 years later, went back and was like, look, guys, it's a fucking masterpiece, but how could I have, like, I, I viewed it whatever way I viewed it when it released. And I, you know, and I totally, well, it's back, I totally yeah. understand how that can happen. Because as I say, I wrote off Resident Evil 2. I was like, I don't like these characters. They're not the characters I love from the first one. <laughs> I brought all this baggage and context from the first game. And then, as I say, yeah, detached myself from that for a couple of years when the franchise has gotten really bad by the time Resident Evil 5 comes out, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I go back to Resi 2 and I'm like, oh, wow, no, wait, let me reevaluate this. Let's let's change these glasses out, put on different lenses and take it in. Um, but that's why yeah. I do find critique and journalism, especially in games, which are such an ever-evolving medium, very challenging and very difficult. So, like, I'd love to chat a bit about, like, your experience at Edge, what it was like, you know, as you say, you, you reviewed The Last of Us. Like, that had to have been, like... That's an example of a game of a generation, like something that people still talk about yes. so fondly. Um, and I mean, the pressures that are along with that, that like, not even the pressures, but what I'm getting at is like, in the back of your head with an, a property like that, you're like, there. there's two ways you could look at it. One, I'm just gonna slam this to get all the good, all the, all the clicks, <laughs> which I would know you would never do, for example. But then there's the other one of like, you're like, what if, you know, what if I don't like this as much as everybody else does? And then, like, 
I, I guess I'm trying to what I'm trying to get in a very long winded way because I'm not good at, at this is uh, just yeah like what it was like for you having those pressures of those big profile releases yeah I so it there definitely was a lot of pressure however I felt lucky in that Edge was like what we called in the magazine industry a long lead publication which means that we finished the issue and then it had to go to a printer and then they had to print it and put the copies of the magazine on trucks and drive them around to shops and so there was all of this like really archaic you know, publishing industry stuff that had to happen between when we wrapped the issue and when it actually um appeared went went on sale yeah it went on and and so because of that uh, fortunately, Edge, you know, had the esteem. It had, it yes. had been around. We you know, celebrated 20 years of the magazine while I was you know, during the three-year window that I was on the editorial staff. Uh, so, I mean, that's an incredible pedigree. And with all of the, like, just think about all of the gaming websites, Joystick, and all these others that have mm. popped up, done amazing work, and then unfortunately have been laid to waste by the difficulties of the, you know, advertising, yes. uh, you know, environment and those sorts of things. But uh, developers, because Edge had had a really insightful uh, window into games because the built up over years and years of just caring about the craft of how games are designed. Uh, you know, when I got my business card after joining you know, the magazine, which was a really proud moment because of how much I loved Edge and respected it. Mm. Uh, getting the business card was you know, a really exciting moment for me. And I, I remember looking at it and uh, seeing beside my name, it had the Japanese you know, kanji pronunciation of my name. And that wasn't just to be you know, elitist, almost like the the idea of getting Chinese characters tattooed on you is like, <laughs> oh, that was very 1990s kind of cringy, like trying to look exotic, uh, yeah. taking this shortcut to to being exotic or you know mysterious or whatever. Even though the tattooist probably tattooed you know, the Chinese <laughs> character for like dipshit or something <laughs> on the back of the person's neck. But the uh, the the Japanese pronunciation on the business card was was very important because. Because Edge loved games as much as it did, it was very in touch with the fact that Japan was really the birthplace of the, modern, of the modern video game. And you know, some would say, you know, one of the like the founding you know, regions of all video games, of video games in total. I'd agree. Obviously, you have Ralph Baer, and you have you know Pong, and you have some of those things happening in the United mm. States. But in terms of what we think of as video games today. I mean, the foundational titles, I mean, you just do a roll call. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, talk about founding genres, you know, Donkey Kong and Jumpman, yes. you know, founding the platforming genre and, uh, and then just absolutely bringing it to the entire world with Super Mario Brothers. So Edge, like, loved video games and was savvy about who we had to thank for the, mo for the video games that we loved mm. uh, today. And so... To, again, I'm just I'm just as long-winded as anybody, but <laughs> but to but to tie it back in, uh, developers like appreciated that we cared that much about the craft of games, so they would give us they would break some of their rules for how early they would send out review wow. code, uh, and so we would get some of the games that we reviewed, we would get to play the games before anyone else, just because we were a print magazine with yeah. a, like a month, like, you know, an insanely long lead time. So I, me I, I mentioned that because it allowed us, it was a gift in a way, uh, because it allowed us to play through the games without any noise of like other people in the, um, I don't know what the, you would call it, the, the Twitterati or the comment <laughs> commentariat is yes. the is the term I was looking for. Uh, you you didn't have the rest of the commentariat saying, "Oh, this is this game is overhyped," or "This is you know informing your opinion." You got to play it in a little bit of a vacuum, in a bubble, because, yeah, in a bubble. And so I think that was a bit of a gift that because when like I was it. playing The Last of Us, I had I didn't know anybody else who had played The Last of Us while I was playing Whoa. it. 
Like, um, I, when I was reviewing The Last of Us, because I reviewed it in, I, yeah, I reviewed it, it was about 20, 2012, 2013, when it released. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I, I also reviewed it, but I had a very dim, uh, different experience. I got it on a Tuesday. It, it came in my letterbox uh, review copy. I still have it up here behind me. Cool. And uh, it came in my letterbox on a Tuesday and they were like, yeah, embargo lifts Thursday. So you want to have your review on Thursday? I'm like, oh shit. So I just have to like jump into it. it and just 15 hours nonstop, you know? And like, oh my God, it didn't, it didn't take anything from the experience for me, but at the same time, I knew that there was this big pressure of like, I gotta get this out the, the day of. Yeah. And like, sometimes that's actually really bad, especially when you're an online publication because it's so saturated day of release, you're probably better off waiting three or four days and letting the dust settle a little bit before you. But there is mm -hmm. that, there's that underlying feeling of, no, 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 well, we, you know, I've gotta be the first. I've gotta be one of the first uh, yeah. to do this. And um, I liked it with the YouTube channel, I very much re re uh, kind of, taking myself out of that and i'm like i'm gonna review ghost of the but i'll review it in like two months like i'm not i'm yeah. not feeling any pressure with this there's no one telling me you have to have it done day of release i'm just like i'll get to it when yeah. i get to it you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a luxury i mean it's a luxury because you're playing the game the way that it's designed to be played it's yeah. not it's not designed to be uh binge played in the same way that you could say that a Netflix series is designed to be binge watched and they release them all in yeah. in one go because they expect you to to just you know <laughs> they for, like hanger. force feed yourself sixteen episodes in a row <laughs> over some you know, I don't know, ninety six hour bender or something. But um But yeah, it's you know, they're not doing anybody any favors by saying, Hey, here's this delicious steak we want you to finish it in two swallows yeah. and then we, yeah. And then we want you to, to puke onto a plate and then <laughs> scan that plate and then put it up on the internet. I mean, that's essentially <laughs> what's happening when you have somebody force feed themselves a video game and, and force out a review uh, in, like, in that kind of, in a 48, 72 hour window. It's not doing anybody any favors. Definitely. Like when I look at what I'm, um like what the ecosystem is like now by comparison to when I visited you in Bath and you were at Edge, like it's, I could not imagine if I was working at a publication or for an online site, you know, and I had to review The Last of Us 2 and A, there's all the pressures of what had come up around it. B, it's a 30 hour game. Like you're not, and to do it justice, you're going to want to play it in bits and pieces. You're not going to want to go, yeah. okay, let's just play it. 20, 27 and a half hours straight like and um yeah. so when i saw people when i saw that game that was the one i feel like for me that really really opened my eyes to how much video game journalism has changed over the past like I, there's there's fundamentals that haven't for sure uh, for the longest time but looking at metacritic and what metacritic has done to the way people interpret video games media or as you say, right, I always trusted Edge. And the reason I always trusted Edge is me and my mates would always say uh, it's the Famitsu of Europe, you yeah. know, because we knew that Famitsu yeah. was this massively well-respected Japanese magazine that if Famitsu gives something a 40, it was like, dude, this is the greatest game of all time. Famitsu gave it a 40. And it was the same with Edge. I remember when they gave Ocarina of Time a 10, I was like, well, Ocarina of Time is going to be the best goddamn game ever made. Full stop. If Edge gave it a 10, <laughs> um, you know. Um, and I, I find that it's... It's so hard nowadays because even ratings, the ratings and review systems feel you can go to one site and a five means average and you go to another site and a five means bad. And you're like, there's, it's so hard to navigate nowadays as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there are so many layers of challenges like on the, on the journalism ecosystem. And obviously I can say that now as a little bit of an elder statesman who's, on the sidelines, I'm I'm not you know, actively reviewing games. I've been working in the video game industry uh, side of things for the well, I was for the past six and a half years before yeah. um, you know, as you mentioned, transitioning out to kind publishing. of have a new adventure and, and yeah. launch this book publishing company. Uh, however, I think one of the the difficult things has been the you have the access, the democratization of of media has allowed anybody with 
uh, an internet connection to to start a games website. Yes. And that is amazing. And I'm and I'm so glad that that everybody has that access uh, to have an opinion on the internet. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to sit here and be an elitist and say that, you know, if there's subpar writing on a games blog somewhere that you know, some Stasi, you know, secret police should go and you know, <laughs> cut the wires on their, on their, you know, internet connection and, and take them out of the conversation. Yeah. However, it hasn't been entirely good for games uh, criticism because no. sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes it's hard to figure out, okay, who is you know approaching this from a objective a point of like yeah i mean none of, like i'm not going to pretend like any of us are are completely you objective. know like <laughs> yeah i mean we all we all come with when you were talking about the fact that sometimes you can harsh on a on a game and then come back to it later and love it it could just be you ate something that didn't agree with you the night before like what uh <laughs> I think in uh, in the Christmas Carol, what Scrooge calls like he thinks one of the apparitions is like an undigested piece of potato or something. Uh, you know, sometimes our our really uh, damning video game con reviews can just be a a product of the fact that our romantic partner broke up with us a week yeah. before, and so we were playing the game under this fog of you know, we were just annoyed and but life continues and and so yeah, I mean that's. I mean, we could you know, talk about whether objectivity True. exists. I think <laughs> it does to an extent. I think you can be more and less objective. Uh, but I think the incentives uh, for people who are wanting to be legitimized by video game companies who are starting up a blog uh, and they're reviewing video games, even though there is an incentive to look um, like you're very, you know, you're a tough critic and uh, and that can bring a kind of yeah it can bring a sort of prestige to be like the uh, food writer in in Ratatouille who yes. doesn't like anything he tastes <laughs> and and that makes him look you know it's like the Simon Cowell uh, yeah. character on uh, you know some yeah you know, it's, it's this country's got talent sort of thing it, it, like it, there's this saying by um, that Steven Pinker quotes and I, I quote it all the time <laughs> uh, but he says and what is it? A a pessimist sounds like they're trying to save you from something, and an optimist sounds like they're trying to sell you something. <laughs> and I think that's, that's the dilemma of of sometimes in journalism is you look like a more serious journalist or critic if you pan something yeah. than if you love it. Uh, and so that can wait if you're looking not for the truth about the beauty of a piece of art, but if you're looking for social prestige and recognition by you know, other critics. And that's one thing that's a really nasty part of game journalism is yes. a lot of times people are just writing to impress their Other, fellow critics yeah. and the people who follow them on Twitter rather than like doing what I was doing with The Last of Us where I was kind of in a, little, in a, in in a, a vacuum bubble. and yeah, and just trying to, I could have been writing to impress, you know, Neil Druckmann and yeah. Bruce Straley, but but I wasn't. I was. was I loved the game, the game, and I, I was. I was writing for me, and I knew that it was special, and I knew that it was treating video the video game medium with a level of respect that yeah. it is not always treated. Very I mean, true. When we were when I was um, talking to Straley in the the interview that I had with them shortly before the game's release, mm -hmm. I went to a press event in London. And they happened to be there. And like I said, at that point, they hadn't sent out review code to to all of yeah. um, sort of the general kind of crowd of journalists. Uh, so they were dying to talk to somebody who had actually played through the entire <laughs> game. And, and because I had gotten the, the review code early uh, because of you know, my connection as a, yeah. as a, yeah, being on the edit, editorial staff in, of Edge and reviewing the game early, they, they're like, can we chat with you after? Because we were dying to know if you <laughs> nice. liked it and you and find out about my experience with it. And uh, and Bruce uh, Straley, he he said uh, even the name that they came, that they settled on for the video game, it was a very unconventional name, The Last of Us. Like it wasn't 
manhunt or yeah, yeah. Like, grand theft blood oh. murder or you know these like really yeah. like in your face names it was it had some subtlety to it even yeah. the grammar of the name the last of us yeah uh, you know it's it's a little bit odd and it's a little bit off kilter and so he he was saying why can't video games like a, a film like an art house picture can have yeah. a name like the last of us why can't video games have a name like the last of us and it's so true yeah it really like it's crazy. I love hearing all that stuff because, like, as I say, I definitely feel like, like, I think there's some incredible, I do think there's some incredible games journalism out there at the moment. But like, funnily enough, I think a lot of it these days for me comes from ex, uh, ex industry vets who maybe have left your know, magazines, etc., but are now doing YouTube channels or podcasts or like Greg Miller's uh, not so fu- kind of funny podcast or Alana Pierce. Yeah, the McElroy brothers, like yeah. incredible. Like I think stuff, that yeah. turning it, taking it away from, as you say, kind of like I'm going to write something to impress, which is what a lot of up and comers kind of try to do, as you say, maybe to legitimize what they're doing. But um, get sent more review games. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't, again, I don't want to be too cynical. <laughs> yeah. This is not, you know, describing every exactly you know, aspirational, a... you know, game critic. But yeah, it's there. There is there is some of it there, obviously. Like, but obviously, it's not the you know. We're not saying that this is a blanket statement about games journalism. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I just think that those ones that have spent eight, ten years in the industry seen the good, the bad, and come out the other side of it, and now they're able to talk about video games in a completely different way i think that that's something that i've started to appreciate a lot more um but actually just this is going to go, take it off we're just going to veer here we're wherever you want to go I'm, yeah. I'm 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 your guest so gonna, i'll, I'll you're gonna, driving so just we're gonna take spin me. the wheel because <laughs> we're, we're talking about your your work in journalism and then like it's funny because i think when i was living in malta i found out that you were working at riot and i was like whoa mm-hmm. that's amazing and I think even at one point I was like, hey, can you get me a job at Riot possibly? And you were like, look, here's like, I'll give you a recommend, like or whatever, but you still have to go through all the standard process, yeah. of course. And I was like, I, and I, then it was like, I couldn't afford to stay in Dublin and all the rest of it. But what yeah. I'm getting at is like, what was that like for you? A, you are transitioning from games journalism into development. And B, you are, I, I think that there's something kind of really beautiful, prodigal son-esque about coming back to Ireland as well. Uh, yeah. Because when we met, you were just like, I love Ireland. I love it so much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like. I do. I do. I've, I always have. And there was something as much as I was absolutely floored uh, and thrilled to get the Edge job. It was bitter. It was still bittersweet to uh to leave Dublin and uh, and and move over to the UK uh, because I had I dreamed of you know coming back to to Ireland for so many years and had finally taken the leap you know moved over uh, you know it, it felt like a bit of a YOLO <laughs> jump, <laughs> jump out of the plane without a parachute and then flap my arms really hard and <laughs> and see if I could see if I could fly. Uh, but I was I was moving back in 2009 at the worst possible time for oh, God. Uh, yes. I mean that was that was literally the the start like yeah. of the Great Depression yeah and uh, or the the Great Recession. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, both. Don't worry. Was, for me, this was <laughs> literally 1929 <laughs> that I was moving back to <laughs> the Grapes of Wrath. It was all. <laughs> it was yeah. It was this Dust Bowl and you know, if Ireland is anything, it is definitely the opposite oh, of the Dust, Dust Bowl. True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it was so exciting and, and so personally meaningful to finally get back to Dublin that the only only job I ever, I, c- I can imagine choosing to, to leave so shortly after, because I, th- I think I was only back 18 months before oh, I, wow. I took the job at, uh, at Edge. Uh, and that was, it was partly a product of just needing my wife and I had had our first child mm. and so we were scraping you know underemployed as they say and yes. you know scraping together you know money from odd jobs and we just realized that you know it was it was okay for us to skip meals <laughs> but we for, we couldn't yeah not when you're entrusted with a with a human life that, a that you're human. raising who's yep. <laughs> yeah so so that was that was where the the desperation of 
of needing to get something more full time uh, in place. And then the opportunity, I was actually just dosing, you know, um, on Twitter at the, at the time, like I was supposed to be writing a column, uh, a games <laughs> column for my former magazine back in the US. And I, th and I was scrolling through Twitter and I saw the Edge job uh, across my timeline saying they were looking for a reviews editor. And, and so I applied and wasn't, you know, wasn't expecting much, uh, but, you know, got, in, got invited to, didn't hear anything back for a few days and, and rang them up and, and uh, talked to the editor of the magazine, uh, Tony Mott at the time. And he said, well, you're, um, you know, the salary that you were asking was, was just way out of bounds. So we just never responded. And it wasn't, again, I wasn't asking for six figures or anything, <laughs> but I didn't realize how little game journalists get paid. And so I was asking for you know, what seemed like a, about what I was you know, making in the US. And, yeah. and then they said, uh, you know, here's the, the range. And um, it, was, it was so low that I, I was just, I was I was kind of blinking for a second, like wow, I don't even know if we can. I mean, I have a wife and a kid, and kid, yeah. like to move to a foreign country, you know, like that's Again, on this eighteen months after. The like, yeah, exactly. Country, yeah, for for that wage, like was going to be very difficult, but I just knew that I had to do it because I just had this, like, my love of Edge and also my spidey sense that it was yeah. going to have, it was going to open up life experiences and opportunities that were going to, to that I would give up any financial comfort to, yeah. to have a window into that. And I, and I could not have been more right. It was, yeah. it was a dream job. It, it, just getting to interview like Todd Howard and Hideo yes. Kojima mm -hmm. and, you know, and Arndt Jens Jensen of uh, Play Dead yeah. and, and just to visit all of these amazing game studios to get to, you know, visit Gorilla, you know, oh, Gorilla Games yeah. in Amsterdam, and and get a tour of their studio, and you know, interview the you know, the Our president and, and now, all the game game yeah. directors, and yeah, now he's a higher up in within Sony, Sony, and yeah, it's crazy. Herman, yeah, Herman Hulst, and I mean, these are these are heroes, uh, creative yeah. heroes of mine, and again, I. Um, that the roll call of of some of those opportunities is not to name drop and and try to sound like uh you know the cool kid it it really is i am very thankful to edge and very humbled that they gave me they trusted me enough to put me in front of of those legendary um individuals uh to try to glean some of what they'd learned about game design I totally feel that because oftentimes when I'm even talking about who I've interviewed here on the show, it might it might come across like, oh, well, he's just name dropping and et cetera, but it's just a passion. I'm just so excited at the possibilities of, like I get just excited interviewing someone like yourself or Philip J. Reed who have written books about things that I love or Jack who is an amazing artist and then Leon from Resident Evil 2 and Steve Palmer from Red Dead. <laughs> it's like, for me, yeah. my my favorite thing about all of this is that on every conversation we're just shooting the shit about the things that we love and to me yeah. that's just and and I, it, i'd say it would not matter who like you said right those these people who are our creative heroes it doesn't matter if you sit in a room with the vast majority of those people you will just be like oh the great thing about this person is that we instantly have a connection in that we both like this thing or we wouldn't yeah be they love uh, i mean and every yeah, I, I didn't interview anybody where I felt like they were just doing it for for the money or the prestige, because um, I interviewed a lot of indie developers as well. Yeah. I mean, I I interviewed people like yourself, you know, when <laughs> you're like working on indie projects yeah. and uh, you know lots of lots of developers who, you know, Jasper Byrne and oh, who, you know, they, yeah, Lone I mean, they might have had games and. You know, in the PlayStation Store, or but these were, you visit them and they're living in, you know, small bedroom you know, flats. Devs. Yeah, like bedroom yeah, devs. They are, they are, they are quite literally bedroom devs, and and they Terry, are one hundred percent not doing. Terry, Cabin Terry, is another yeah, one, yeah, creator, creator of 
I mean, all, like his Super games hexagon. all have. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, yeah, as anybody sorry. who knows me knows, I played an obscene amount of Super Hexagon, <laughs> and I will completely, just unabashedly boast about one thing, uh, <laughs> like patting myself on the back for one achievement. I was the first person in the world, uh, outside of Terry, to complete the hardest uh, level on Super Hexagon. So, nice. That is that is sweet. <laughs> So I remember he sent around a test flight, a kind of pre-release build of the game and he, to some friends and journalists and, and yeah. people just to kind of get a little taste for it and to get some early feedback. And I remember there was a there was a, a, a little bit of a race between us to see who could <laughs> complete the game first. And uh, I think it was me, the two front runners to do it were me and uh, Colin, He's a he's an indie developer himself. He has a oh. there's a character in Spelunky that uh, the jungle Jesus. hat and kind of blonde. Is he hair. also he's from the same place? Well, he he lives in the same place that Terry does. Like same. Well, he thing. was traveling around with his wife. Uh, I met a he guy was, named like, traveling Colin. around the world and developing games from like exotic locales just oh, over wow. over internet, and uh, but he had he beat there was like the three sets of levels. Uh, yeah. I think Hexagonist was like the third level, but then and then you had to, and then it was kind of the last three levels, and Super Hexagonist mm. was like the hardest one. But he beat Hexagonist before me, and I was like, oh, damn it! I've, I, you know, my competitive instincts kicked in, and so I was playing, <laughs> you know, an obscene number of hours, you know, every night after work, and and uh, so it, that was just a, a fun thing again with people who are obsessed with with some of these difficult with these games challenging and, yeah exactly yeah. and I, I believe it was i believe it was my my good buddy neve houston uh chip zell did the soundtrack for that game as well if i'm not mistaken oh god yeah that was like part of what blew my mind about the yeah, game she's amazing she's such an awesome chip tune artist uh yeah she's oh, I'm, I like class that. I've like a dream about having her on, uh, you know, I have a, a podcast of my own nice, called the Jason yes. Killingsworth podcast. And I was like, oh, I want to have. Dude, Chip I'll let Zola. me, I'll hook you up. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> introduce you on Facebook and when we'll get chatting. Cause like, she's amazing. Um, again, know her back. I love how these connections just happen. I just think the world is such an interesting place. I always think of it as literally like um, a, a body and just the ve we're all just these veins that just overlap and interconnect in ways that we never expected like i love it um, i love it and i mean she like she did not um get rich for like doing the soundtrack no. to super hexagon um but I, like i hope terry doesn't mind me i don't know if he'll listen to this but <laughs> i hope he doesn't mind me just bigging him up because he Oh, he is amazing. such a mild-mannered, shy, soft-spoken yeah. talent. He's like this amazing yeah. talent, this world-beating sort of talent. But he's so, um, so shy, and and I, I found out that he had uh, after the release, after the game did really well, that that he uh, paid for Neve to go to GDC. Oh, that's uh, just isn't just it? out of his own pocket, just as a thank you for. The amazing work that she did on the game That's so cool and like, i was just like god that is like these are the people the heroes like you know we talked about the kojima and, and yeah. todd howard and some of these like you know will Wright, like those kind of people who are um tim schaefer and lights yeah 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 tim schaefer like the people whose name appears on the box yeah exactly. you know, it says a a such blank a, a blank game a hideo kojima game a yeah like a tim schaefer game mm -hmm. almost like they're like they're wes anderson auteurs yes. of video games but it's like when you meet some of the some of those people who who don't have their name in lights and they just blow you away with their humility and their talent um like um, that's that's where you really have, have you ever with it on a whole other level have you ever, during your time, I mean, we talked about Terry and we talked about, I actually like that the conversation is steered into this because I think it is good to champion these these people. Um, have, did you ever interview uh, Mike Bithell, Thomas Was Alone, uh, creator of Thomas Was Alone and stuff? No, we had a, we had a few interactions, uh, friendly interactions on on social media. Yeah. And I loved, I loved Thomas Was Alone. Oh, so good, it, so good. It was, I mean, the idea, it really just kicked the the stool legs out from under this idea that you had to have a billion polygons yeah. to 
create an emotional connection to he made you care about a rectangle like yeah or, yeah or whatever and you would start referring to them like oh man green is sad that's so that that hurts me <laughs> <laughs> it's i i think it was, it's a phenomenal game yeah it was genius yeah yeah um so i was i was a huge fan and i never got to formally interview yeah. him uh but i, I love the game and, and had a few little friendly tweets back and forth he, like he seems ago. He seems like another person that is, again, very humble, very, you know, aware that he's like, look, I know where my space in this video game ecosystem is. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm not here to try and be Hideo Kojima or whatever. I'm, I'm happy to just make these small, compelling games that, like, they, he did yeah. uh, John Wick Hex, uh, which was also a lot of fun. Um, a bit a bit of a step, a bit of a change for Thomas Was Alone. Uh, which, yeah. I, I wanted to do Thomas Was Alone because he's good friends with Troy Baker. I'd love him to do Thomas Was Alone too, Alone Harder with Troy Baker and as the voice of the lead role. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like one of the things I'm fascinated with, and so this is just kind of bubbling up in my mind now as I'm, I'm starting this new company and you know we're publishing books and, and I want it to be successful because I want to be able to do it for a long time because I love it so much. And so one of the things about like starting a venture for it to be successful, there's a certain amount of self-promotion mm -hmm. that you, that you need to do in order to make it successful because people don't just get emotionally connected to like products. They like, we all have an, we, we get connected with people that 100%. we, that we like, you know, we talked about like me and my wife, we had that like, you know, spark Inspired. of connection. We do the same things with creative people when we find somebody doing creative work and they're like, God, that guy just gets it or yes. girl, you know, just like they, they're, they just get what they I love. They're me. doing the kind of thing I love, <laughs> but we connect with their game in a lot of cases. Um, it's not like, it's not an absolutely essential piece because there were, as a kid, I loved games long before I knew that they were even made by human beings i thought they just appeared out of <laughs> out of heaven uh, uh, so i'm tr i'm trying to navigate this uh a little bit myself in terms of like i get why certain creators put their name on the box yeah. i i know why tim schaefer puts his name on the box and it and why he talks to the press a lot and why mm -hmm. you know cliff blazinski you know, was, was very friendly with the press and tried to develop those relationships because it it served the games. It mm. like got more people to try the games. It got, um, you know, it served a marketing purpose. And I, I don't think that needs to be entirely- Disingenuous. Uh, stigmatized. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I I'm, get... yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to navigate the same thing of, you know, how much do I, you know, sort of trumpet my connection to Tune and Fairweather and 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 kind of use my own, like build my own profile in yeah. order to try to get people to check out, hopefully, the good work we're doing. Um, well, something that I've kind of learned from moving from video games to film to this to as well is that, yeah, like you are, you're, with any of this stuff, you are your own brand. I mean, I think even from journalism, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, I remember the journalists that like have that kind of, like, as I say, like a Greg Miller or an Alana Pierce, they have a very definitive personality about them. Um, yeah. But um, I think a lot of the, the hardest part about that is that that requires a certain amount of vulnerability it requires a certain amount of putting yourself out there. I've learned very quickly, I never understood streaming. I never understood how somebody would, why somebody would want to watch somebody play games. And then I realized it's not about playing games. Like games are so secondary when you're watching streaming. Hmm. It's about the connection to the person. Like, yeah. okay, there's different, like I watch, I watch a speed runner. I watch him to watch the game because he's amazing. Um, but nine times out of 10, if I land on a stream and I end up following it, I end up donating or subscribing or whatever it's because i'm like oh, like you just said about the creators it's like this person gets it they get what i mean yo and yeah uh, yeah i think that it is it can be challenging to put so much of yourself out there into the world and because then if there is a negative backlash about anything you take the brunt of it very and this is something yeah. actually i had one very brief and this is kind of a name drop i apologize but i did have one kind of brief interaction with cliff blazinski back when i was a developer and during that, he said to me, you know why I'm Cliffy B? Because that's a persona. And if I wasn't Cliffy B, and if I was just Cliff Blazinski, and with some of the shit that people says about me, 
I would cry to myself to sleep every night. He was like, but I don't care what they say about Cliffy B because he's not me. Like Cliffy B right. is a whole other thing. He is like the equivalent of, like I've heard about this in other media, uh, like Beyonce, she has a persona when she walks out on stage, she's yes. Sasha, is it Sasha Fierce? That Sasha is, Fierce, yeah. Yeah, is her onstage persona who, you know, wears these ridiculous sequins outfits with like her, her thighs, like, you know, kind of <laughs> out on display and, and yes. the real like Beyonce, uh, when you see, like I watched the Netflix documentary of her and you see her in rehearsal and you see her, you know, she would do a, you know, a prayer with like some of the dancers before like a day of rehearsal. And, and she just, she did seem like a genuinely, uh, you know, a quite shy, mild bold, mannered, like yeah. mild mannered person. Uh, but she is able to do that, you know, deliver that performance and steps into that other persona. And then she just looks like, you know, Queen Bee, like, yeah. you know, when she when she goes out on the stage, and and I love that. I I I think that whether everyone gets that it's a performance or not, um, I think that's slightly beside the point uh, mm. because you know we, yeah, like we all have to do things that we're you know uncomfortable with, and and even though like this is a very comfortable interview just because yeah. we're mates and. Um, you know, there are going to be, there will hopefully, be other you know, moments where you know, there are people interested in, in Tuna Fairweather who, you know, I'm, like, I would love for them to say nice things about the company, and I, I'm going to need to check myself to make sure I'm being authentic with them and that I'm yes. I'm not, you know, just, you know, I don't know. I, I like the idea of trying to bring yourself into those situations where you're not just trying to you know, put on a performance or try exactly. to look like the like the super put together you know yeah like publishing be, veteran <laughs> i think yeah like people respond to like humanity that's my thinking anyway like when you see that we you know because we are we're you're know, being human there's like beyonce is a great example because beyonce almost feels like her her, her performance her character if you didn't see that behind the scenes like she feels like an otherworldly being because it's that level of Completely. kind of status um but i yeah. love i, I find I find that you connect with people, like I connect with people over things like, yes, I've, I've suffered with depression since I was 16 years old and it's been challenging and there's been really high points and really low points in my life. And, and I think that a lot of people, you do get people, I will be totally transparent, that say, oh my God, you drama queen, get over it. Like, you know, I, you do get those comments as well, but you get a lot of people yeah. who say, well, I thank you so much for saying this because I suffer with depression myself and I did, I, it's just nice to hear somebody else normalize it and talk about it in a way that do isn't like, as you said earlier, there's no stigma attached to, to talk yeah. about that stuff. The the fortunate thing with the work that I'm doing with Tuna Fairweather is that because Tuna Fairweather at this stage um, is kind of just me, mm. you know, it's it's me and obviously like, you know, our art director, you know, it's not just me, I'm not doing everything. I have mm. incredibly, like essential collaborators that are helping bring the books to life, but it's still a very, very, a very small, small circle. So team. I'm answering the customer service emails and then I'm, you know, shipping out a, you know, a new order and at the kitchen table and basically it up and, touching those books and getting them packed away. I love that. <laughs> yeah. At least for the first, we're going to work with a warehouse partner. So I won't, you know, be in the shipping business forever, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm really glad that we're here talking about the Tuna Fairweather stuff, though. Um, I wanted to talk about this. Um, like, what, what gets you excited? I mean, obviously, you were very excited about this new venture that you've, you're, you're going to with Tuna yeah. Fairweather. What is it about the world of publishing that gets you excited? And obviously, I would love to know if you have any future plans for stuff, but at the same time, I fully understand that baby steps and this is you know you died is is the first on a, in a long journey i imagine of what we're going to i hope so yeah with. i hope i hope the you know when you're on a on a ride at a theme park and you know it's on sort of a timer and it's like going around this <laughs> loop like a little roller coaster or something and and you don't know exactly when it's going to end or you're on the swings that are like swinging out or something and yes and 
like some sort of carousel and then you know that there's a timer and then it, that it shuts down and starts slowing down after a minute and a half or something but you don't you don't want it to end and you're like oh yeah. this is so fun i hate that it's gonna start slowing down and and so i feel like i am on that carousel and like every single loop around is uh like publishing a book yeah and so we've published the first one uh and we're lucky to have a bunch of support on Kickstarter and yes. and we've you know used that we've reinvested every single like penny of that Kickstarter like into the business yes. to buy like a label printer to like be able to you know so that we don't have to put sellotape on all the labels <laughs> to put them on the boxes yeah. and we've tried to be really disciplined about not taking any money out of that for yes. just like personal like personal yeah, exactly. Because we want to set the company up for success. Yes. And so you died was like the first time around that ride and it was it had ups and downs and it it was like really high when we were, you know, finishing the Kickstarter and we're like, ah, oh, the Kickstarter did so well, let's drink some yellow spot and celebrate. <laughs> and then it got like really low when we realized how much it was going to cost to actually <laughs> ship out like sixteen hundred books and I was like pricing out different um you know, delivery methods. And, and they're gorgeous some, books, like, they're stunning. Like They're like, heavy, yeah, they're... Yeah. One of the, the blessing and the curse of, like, trying to do really high-end, like, really beautiful, um, like, I want to release, like, the most beautiful books that people yes. have seen that can compete want to with, like, Folio and, Society. And, yeah. Yeah, and, like, want to have in that pride of place on their shelf. Just like you've got, you know, behind you on your shelf, like, there are like some of these items that like you love and you they matter. Yeah. You want, sh you want to show off and they mean something to you. And I want our books to, to be the same. It like, looks like it's from the it. world of dark souls. Like that's the thing about <laughs> it. it. You know what I mean? Got, uh, yeah. The, yeah, exactly. I mean, we put the, we literally took the pattern off of the rose window in the central cathedral in, in Orlando. Yeah. And like took the design shape language of the rose window uh, and used it to develop this ornate pattern that we debossed into the front cover. It's gorgeous. And we wanted it really, really deep, that, that impression <laughs> in the cover. That emboss. Yes. So a little, a little, I didn't even know the term deboss existed because I, oh, I only knew the term emboss. Yes. Yeah, emboss is when you, when you push up from the back, yeah. when you stamp from the back and it like kind of pushes up the impression on the, on the cover, a deboss is when you, the stamp Go goes from the outside in, and so that's what we did with with the cover nice. of the yeah the the die that um, that was doing the stamping impression. It like goes in from the top, and so it it's actually recessed into the book, nice. almost like it's been sculpted like with a hammer and chisel, and so it has all these grooves, and it almost looks like a front of a cathedral, like yeah. where you've got these deep recesses where that pattern is has been sculpted by the by the stamp. See, it's it's funny. I'm going to tell you a little story that like I, I hope you don't get upset by this, but like I was chatting to my wife about this interview earlier. As I say, she picked out my Jason t-shirt. Um, <laughs> which and she did not know I was coming out to chat to you, Jason. And she was like, "What about this?" Did she know that I have kill Did she know that I have kill in my surname? <laughs> I think because I once you <laughs> once you pair the first name with the surname, it starts to get a little bit sketchy. Jason as well. kills. Yeah, <laughs> that's the sixth. Yeah. Um, no, but um, and I was born on Friday the thirteenth. No, I'm just. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa. But I said to her, I, I, like, I was saying about your book, and I was like, you did a book on Dark Souls, and it's it looks really cool. I really want to pick up a copy. And she was like, cool. How much is it? And I said, I think there, I think it's about like eighty bucks, eighty ninety bucks for like the you know for like a pretty nice one. And she's like, eighty bucks for a book? Like shocked. And I was <laughs> like, I said to her, I was like, but I was like, you know me. I was like, you know I love Resident Evil. You know I love Rick and Morty. You know I love whatever. I'm like, if I'm passionate about something, I don't mind paying. For something if you know and they're just like i'm talking about like things that are just display whereas this is a book that also gives you content that you can actually yeah. read um not just here's the statue to put on your mantelpiece uh, right, but i was right. like i was like yeah see and then once i explained it to her in those terms she was like oh i kind of get it actually i was like fandoms are a very interesting thing it's like, something i've been talking about a lot lately is fandoms because there's a lot of toxicity in fandoms there is for sure but mm. And, and a lot of that comes from what fandoms are, which is people press the identity of something into themselves. Hmm. And then, with, so if somebody says, 
if I say like I'm a gigantic Resident Evil fan and somebody says well I hate Resident Evil I go oh he hates me he hates yeah, me yeah yeah we doesn't. do we, <laughs> we sort of wrap like we do we wrap our identities in some of those things that we love yeah and then so you take a personal offense almost and sometimes if there's different and but that's where the toxicity can come in but also where it can be like there is a lot of joy I found in fandoms as well the Resident Evil community that I've become uh, part of on Twitter is just again where when you have a fandom where people understand that hey guess what we're not all going to like the same things we are going to like elements and this and that and different things but we are all here by our shared love of, of the the umbrella of this all yeah. that was a pun i wasn't ex- intending but i'll take it <laughs> amazing <laughs> that is so good so but good. like like that if i if i suddenly off the back now of playing bloodborne and you know now i'm getting back into dark souls i might become a gigantic souls fanboy out the back of this you know it's happened in the past to me with other stuff yeah. um, and if it does i'm going to be that person that wants the, the you know a big statuette of the monsters and wants the book and wants this stuff because you mm-hmm. want to show you're like i'm a fucking fan okay <laughs> <laughs> and, and i am a fan yeah, like, exactly. I'm, I'm i'm a i'm a super fan and so i think like if it's driven from a place of this is 100 percent. i designed a book that i would spend 80 quid on exactly. i mean that's just the, that's just the reality of it like if it's a game that i love and it's it's sad like how like bastardized like game packaging has become like where you'll spend like 90 quid for just this cheap little steel like steel case dvd thing and, I was just and we still do it one. <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm not harshing on i'm not no, harshing no, no. on anybody who, who who puts this like puts a blu-ray disc in a, in a case and you know like they're they're working within the constraints of that medium yes. but like i think a lot at least in my, yeah in my little corner of the universe it, because games are an intangible art form aside from like they're not even physical media anymore for the most part like people are like their game library is like a steam library on their hard drive and they don't even have a a physical manifestation of a lot of the these games and some of them are some of their favorite games so i felt like dark souls is a game that needs to have a real world almost Again, this is where I have to be like really careful because it can sound like I'm so far up my own, <laughs> up my own arse. Because, like, almost like some kind of talisman, like a conduit to that imaginary reality I get of that. the game. I get And that you want to have a physical item that, like, did you ever see the Never Ending Story? That yes. that the book. So the book. You, yeah. You know the book and the Never Ending yeah. Story. How like when he like picks it up, the seal like glows. Oh my god, that seal actually has like intertwined snakes, doesn't it? Like kind of an yeah, Ouroboros it does, yeah. sort of thing. A tune in Fairweather is, oh, it's actually the background yeah. there, but it's like, <laughs> it's too, it was inspired by the Book of Kells. And I was going to say, the, it's very Jim Fitzpatrick, uh, kind of, it, well, like that kind of Irish. It's, it's very inspired. Like, I love, I love the Book of Kells. I love illuminated yeah. manuscripts. And, and so I wanted the identity of the company to like pull Speak it, because I think... That. Yeah, I like I have another this is where I get to be a fan of like yeah. out on stuff. So oh, this nice. is a book that like everybody who like who loves beautiful physical wow. objects should read. It's called uh, Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts by Christopher de Hamel. And uh, and so Book of Kells is in here, but he basically um, it's just a book about him going around the world and it's it's mostly Europe, because you know a lot of the oldest you know books are in European yeah, collections true. and in European libraries and reading rooms and universities, um, and it's him like looking at oh wow like these incredible works of art. Uh, yeah. So these are books that were uh, almost treated like sacred objects, uh, and and so they're. They have beautiful illustrations. The pages are ornate. They've got gold leaf encrusted in yeah. parts of them. And and obviously the Book of Kells was, the, I mean, that was you know, the Gospels. It was this holy, yeah. it was a holy, not just the Gospels, but it was a holy book. Uh, and so it's treated almost like a cathedral yeah. that you can hold in your hands. It's a, it's a pathway to the transcendent. 
Yeah. And so I feel, again, this is, this sounds very, very pretentious, but I feel like video games so. are, exist in the transcendent. Like video games exist in your imagination. They exist in, you experience them in a virtual reality, yeah. almost like the same way that people who are extremely religious feel like they interact with spiritual beings yes. like in their, in their dreams. Like they talk in the Bible, it talks about, you know, Jacob, you know, this ladder to heaven, you know, with angels yep. coming up and down it. That's sort of the experience we have with games. So I want, not all our books are going to be about video games. Mm. Uh, like I should say that just to manage expectations because my, like I'm passionate about like art and I don't, yes. Narr I don't limit it just to one Same. Uh, medium. The f so the first, and I think that's true about everyone. I'm not unique in that. Uh, but I want every physical object we create to feel like a kind of... It's bringing you into that the world most that you beautiful love. Beautiful physical, yeah. I, I think we're, we're in a, a situation, and it's, it's actually, it's a good thing for the environment, um, frankly, that a lot of things are becoming digital only. Yeah. Because there's a lot of ugly, like tatty kind of like books that are, I call them ketchup packets. Like that's <laughs> kind of this sort of the term that I've used for them. It's only, it only needs to be beautiful enough to get somebody to spend 12 or 13 quid. I saw a big breakdown of this. You I use it and you just chuck it in the bin. Yeah, I, I saw a big breakdown of this on YouTube where they took like, I think it was eight or 10 of the top best sellers of the last decade. And they were like, they were like, look at how cocky or cookie cutter these covers are that you yeah. could literally, they were like, have a look at the cover. And I know that they say, don't judge a book by its cover, but tell us what any of these books are about because you will not like, you will not get it. Even tonally, <laughs> they were like, you won't even get the tone of the book that's on the inside from the cover because they weren't yeah. coming up with a cover that suited the book. They were just coming up with, well, this cover generally sells well. And we see that with film. Yeah. Um, the, the scariest part about going into distribution on a film is you know you're going to get a distributor and they might say, yeah, your poster is gorgeous, but it, it's not going to sell well. What we're going to do is we're going to put a scantily clad woman and a state of some distress on the ground. And you're like, oh, Jesus fucking Christ, not again. You know? Um, right under my hat. Yeah. I yeah. Know. It's, and, but then like we were blessed with, with the parish that there was a distributor was like, you got Christopher Shoy to do your artwork. The dude is a fucking living legend of poster designs. Why would we change this? And it was like, yes, we hit the jackpot. We get to keep our yeah. poster art. Um, but it's so, yeah, it's so true what you say. Like, um, I, I think that, uh, and and they're not to be displayed. Like when you buy those books, if you go into an Easton's or a Mahoney's and you just pick up a bestseller, you know, like you say, those kind of ketchup packet books, like yeah, they they are not. You're not going to be like ah oh, pride of place. I'm gonna put this up here. Yeah. You're, you're gonna be like into the bin, into a secondhand shop, into yeah, pass it on to your into sister. Into one of those little like yeah, little book, book exchanges, you know, book yeah. exchange, yeah, you know, sort of things at a, at a Starbucks or you're not gonna want to. And it's so funny because like I mean, I have a book here that I've had for God uh, twenty years, I guess. It's nothing fancy, right? It's nothing fancy yeah, at all. Yeah, I want to yeah. make very clear. When I was in my teens and I was getting into Resident Evil. Um, the SD Perry books came out, could not get them in Limerick for the life of me, like at all. It was like, it, but then I went into, there was like a local bookshop and I went in with the ISBN number for the book. Right, said, right, right. I think I had gone to a friend's who had really basic internet, found out the ISBN number and went in and was like, this is they the ISBN number. You. They ordered it in. It cost me like, it cost me about like 16 pound pre euros. Um, <laughs> And I remember, and like something I love about books, and this is the one thing about the physical aspect of books that are, that that for me is so important is the aging. Look at this; it's all yellowed and like it's yeah, the, it's, it's been it's, through the it's wars. Paper, it's wood. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just, uh, I, I sometimes I almost find it weird when I see people try to keep books really pristine because I'm like, the thing about that I love about books is that they age, that they get worn, that they yeah. get, um, and like. I actually kind of like that straight away about even what you guys did with the Dark Souls book is that it almost has that pre-weathered look like it, yeah. as, at least on the outside the outside is stunning I want to say that like but like it looks like it's been through the wars a little bit and that you mm. know 
but again that as you say pulls you into the world the mythos of this world is it's not yeah a nice comfortable sleek it's not a uh, all right angles and fucking you know <laughs> like it's it's tatty not yeah. tatty but like damaged it's yeah damaged. exactly i wanted i wanted that feeling of age to it i wanted i like i love the i mean just like the the snakes behind me the tuna fair with the logo yeah. it's like the yellow snake that is fairweather and he i i told the designer this is Dick Hogg who did the artwork for Hohokam oh, wow. and, uh, and Wilmot's Warehouse. Ooh. And he, he works with Honey Slug a lot. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, he and Ricky Haggett over at Honey Slug, like they, you know, they, they, they're kind of a part, partners in crime. And so they do a bunch of work together. And so I, he was one of those like indie game artists and, and he's contributing a lot to the design. He's not That's just so the cool. art guy, but he does a lot of the, d the design contribution as well now but i reached out to him and was like i know that you do you know illustrations for like you know three mobile and like you know these major <laughs> major companies but like is there any chance you might be willing to you know contribute art to like this you know small startup project that i'm working on and sort of bootstrapping myself and again this is another one of those like terry cavanaugh stories of like somebody who's a monster talent who then who just shows up and and is and super humble super amazing. and super humble and does and does you a solid like yeah. i mean it was it was amazing um the quality of design that he gave me for just an amount that i i, I couldn't even tell you because i'm so embarrassed about oh. how how little it is that, but it was like literally out of my own pocket and i had to do yeah. it in like monthly installments to even for that small amount of money and i'm kind of a little bit embarrassed about that but he didn't so give me like a cheap like version he gave me his best you know quality yeah. work to the point uh, where i even had them uh i don't know if oh whoa you know like, i can see it so i minted That's this so uh cool. this copper coin because dark souls you know has an yeah. item in it called the copper coin and so I, I just thought, oh my God, you know, that's awesome. what is the most stupid, unnecessary thing that we could possibly produce? So I one of the first things so I did was I minted 125 of these. Like it's a really heavy uh, coin, and it and it has uh, Dick's uh, snake logo that he designed for Tune and Fairweather. Like, and you can even I don't even know if see you can see it, but it's actually it is. <laughs> it's raised. The snakes oh, are yeah. kind of raised up off of it so you can actually run your finger over it and feel the they're embossed <laughs> so this is yeah so yeah it, it does feel like the snakes have been kind of yeah pushed up from behind the kind of raising raising them up uh but but yeah so that's super cool when, man when i look i sent a, and i sent dick a free copy of the book awesome. and like and one of the coins and a thank you note just saying like i hope you feel proud when you see you know, see the things we're producing with your artwork on yes. it's on the spine on every every single copy of the book, obviously, as you know, as a publishing imprint, you know, that's the brand mark that's on the spine of the book. I said, I hope you feel proud when you see the work we produce, because I want your artwork to be to be to have pride of place and to be yeah. front and center. Yeah, it's so funny because everything you've just said in the last like four and a half minutes is so incredibly relatable to my experience with Christopher Shoy on The Perished. Um, the only difference being uh, an, in, an article went out on Dread Central about The Perished and uh, Christopher Shoy, who's one of my favorite poster designers in the world, he did posters for Pet Cemetery, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Um, Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. The Changeling, uh, the, the Arrow, new, the new artwork for The Changeling, Dead Space graphic novels, all this stuff. Uh, oh, he, Dead Space. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he he reached he messaged me on Facebook and said, "Hey, I read about this movie that you're making on Dread Central that you made on Dread Central. Do you have a poster designer?" And I messaged back and I said to Barry, my co-founder, "I'm like, dude, we're not like, I could not afford to pay Christopher Shy. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, like you just said, I'm like, I, if I was yeah, making yeah, yeah. an offer on him, it would be so embarrassing amount that he'd laugh off. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then." He was like, dude, I reached out to you because I really like what you're, I, I like the story. I'd love to check the movie out and I'd love to do something for you if you're interested. And we can talk cost later. We can figure out a payment plan. We can come as low as, like really amazing about it all. Um, like you yeah. say, I'm in exactly the same boat that I'm embarrassed. Like I would never 
talk about it, like what it cost. But like, and again, yeah. he didn't phone it in. He didn't just, oh, well, I'll just take the changeling poster and tweak it slightly and same thing. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. He gave it so much. He did two variants. He gave it so much personality. Um, as you say, these guys, like we're all, most people who are creatives are, you know, that, that try to be creatives. We're all, we all struggle with our own work and stuff. So we all are like, I don't know how much my shit is worth. I do, it's so hard mm -hmm. when you're, when you are the person that we look at, yeah. I look at Christopher Shy stuff or, you know, like you look at these people's work and you go like, they're worth it. They're, I'd pay anything to have them like a huge amount. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we, then if somebody came to me and said, hey, I want you to shoot a music video for me, I'd be like, oh, I don't even know what to charge. Like, what could I charge? Because like, I don't know how good or bad I am at that. You know, like. Uh, it's so funny because when the shoe is on the other foot, I find I find it so hard to put a value on my own work. <laughs> like, and we do that everywhere. We do yeah. it like we just we we afford others this dignity that we're so reluctant to claim for ourselves, and and it's there. It's it's sad. It's it's it one is. of the things like I am forty one years old, and I have been so riddled with imposter syndrome for so much of my career uh, where I felt like I felt really uncomfortable, um, you know, taking kind of ownership trumpeting, of anything, taking any credit for yeah. something I had done. It was, it was actually, I mean, to be sort of real with you, it was one of the things at edge uh, that was difficult because edge has this culture of anonymity mm -hmm. or it used, it used to, be much more pronounced because at that at the time that I was you know, on the editorial staff at Edge, it, uh, even features didn't have a byline, a writer wow. byline on them. It was it, there was this mystique about the magazine that it almost um, material was was sort of etched on a stone tablet by <laughs> the hand of God. <laughs> that there was no humans you know involved in the process. It had this kind of religious artifact of like this is the word of God on video games. And it had this authoritative, and the more you put the names of like Scrubs, you know, like me and Joe whatever, and you know, Tina this and you know, Robin that, it's like that almost made it like less of a sacred you know, relic. Yes. And so, but that did actually kind of, it almost like sent my, like my discomfort with like I wanted to share my work I wanted to I wanted more opportunities to yeah, do enjoyable projects and this goes back to that kind of self promotion piece uh but it was it was a very uh countercultural kind of within within the that edge kind of that ecosystem edge. to take credit for anything was to to be seen as as a little bit of a prima donna as a well uh, you know, a detention whore to like put the most crass uh, terms on it yes. so i'm now trying to again and that's not to harsh on edge at all yeah, like, yeah, that was just the culture of the magazine and i'm thankful for every single opportunity i had there but but now going into tune and fairweather it's like i want to i want to promote the work and i want yes. to let people know uh you know what i'm trying to do with it and you know i hope i have a lot of opportunities you know to talk to people like yourself and and say here's what i want to do and here's what i love and here's the people like i'm trying to reach other people like me who are obsessed with beautiful design and and sort of miss that you know those physical beautiful yeah. physical objects that tactile um, yeah like something yeah like i was really insecure about you know like you were talking about undervaluing yourself and like you'll be willing to like value somebody else but i was really insecure with with charging you know, 80 euro for the you know for the black cloth edition but it's so worth like again then from my perspective i look at it and i say it's so worth it but then it's it's another one of these things that is so subjective i guess to some extent because it is like again my wife who has no interest in the souls series is like why would you pay 80 bucks for that but then my best friend who is a diehard fan of the souls books when i our souls games when i showed him the book he was like dude i need to fucking buy this right now like it's 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 yeah like value is so uh i think it's troy baker has an amazing statement about this that i'll botch miraculously when i try to re recount it just give me give me like the general uh, kind of he, gist of it and i'll look it up on google later yeah, and I'll yeah. Type in. 
it's on yeah. um it's on the podcast he does with Mike Bethel, Alana Pierce, and Austin Wintry, but he talks about your know, your value and your worth. Like gold has a value. Ah. And so like gold has a value which changes constantly. Like, you know, the That's value right. yeah. yeah, but it's worth. Yeah, the a go, gold's worth is not anything to do with what we put on it with this financial stuff. It's the fact that it's the best conductor of electricity in the world. And he's like, that hmm. worth has never changed. But the value uh, constantly yeah, yeah, fluctu- yeah. fluctuates. And he's like, know your worth, not your value. And I'm like, ooh, that is a great statement. Like, uh, he seems like a really- I'm stealing the shit out of that. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like a really, again, he talked about how when he started doing VO jobs, he was like, I had no idea what to charge for like, you know, coming in and doing one day's work versus 30 days work on a game. He was like, I had no idea like where to place, you know, my value and stuff. And uh, so I think it is funny because I think a lot of, again, right, going back to what creatives are like, creatives are are our own worst enemies often, like a lot of the time, because, uh, you know, we, we, I've, I've, I identified immediately when we talked about imposter syndrome at the premiere for my film in London last year. I was just like, you should not be here. Like I was telling myself in my head that I did not Mm. deserve to be there. And that like, you know, everybody else did all the hard work and I did nothing, you know, all the, Mm. my brain was just battling me. And um, it's really taken me a while to start to, it's great. I think teams are very important because my team reminds me and not in a, we're going to buff your ego kind of way just my team reminds me of the things I do. They're like, no, no, no. Do you not remember when you did X, Y, Z and how important that was? Hmm. And I'm like, kind of no, because when I'm directing on a film set, I don't, I don't think about it, those things. It just happens and it flies by so yeah. quickly. It's like a wedding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I'd, I'd lo- I, I empathize a lot with what you're saying about uh, those feelings. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're so lucky to have people to remind you of of that worth and remind you and say, hey, like, you know, like the contribution you made, like this is not, this was would never be the same movie it, it is without, like without the contribution that you and, made and thank and, you for it. And that's big of them because they're like, I don't feel like there's a fixed pie in terms of the amount of like, pride people can take in a project like but that yeah. that you giving credit to somebody else that that diminishes the amount of like credit you have left for yourself i yeah, feel like exactly. that is a non-zero kind of, <laughs> it's an infinite there's an infinite supply of pride and joy yes. that you can take in a creative project and it is we should all be looking for how to share that credit around oh that's why i big up our art director andrew hind like i shout him out like every chance i get because the beauty of the book yes it was a collaboration yes we went back and forth and and i'm a bit of you know because i'm that creative director i sometimes i say no i like let's take it in this direction sometimes i say i love this part of it but this other bit, like, can we try something different? And so it's it's constantly a backwards a back and forwards and forth, of, yeah. um, like, any creative collaboration. It's so but, similar to directing. Yeah. It sounds like, I mean, it, there's directing, in both titles, there's directors. So, like, it's very similar to what I do hmm. on a film set. My job is 90% of the time not telling people what to do. That's the, that's the misconception about directing is, oh, you tell people what to do. Absolutely fucking not. I stop in mm. on different departments. So I go into the makeup department and the makeup girl says, what do you think? Should we do this? Should we do that? And your job is more like green lighting stuff intermittently. Like, uh, yeah, could we try this? And then do that. Great. Thank you. Out. And then like come back later and see, you know, how it... as I yeah. say, I think there's a big misconception about what directors in general, like di- people who direct mm. projects do. Um, we're not these tyrannical, like, do <laughs> I'm what? sure there are some of those. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure there's, there's some people who get, like, a kind of this ego thrill from, yeah. like, I tell people what to do. I'm just like the, the whole idea of the nightmare boss who, <laughs> you know, is just constantly micromanaging everybody and looking over their shoulder and saying, oh, actually, no, that needs to be, you know, this shade of orange rather than that shade of orange. And yeah. like, it, it is, it is a very much a, 
like it's a balance that you try to get right of yes i have a vision in my own mind for what i want this to look like and what i want this to and be conveying that to, to but see. i also need other people to feel like they see themselves in their own creative contribution well, as well and i can't try to steer everything i need to know when to yield when and to let yield. other people's yeah let other people's instincts and a lot of times they're better instincts than mine than mine were and then i'm like fucking great i'm so glad you <laughs> disagreed with me on this because your direction is so much better i often say this about the film stuff that like i it's there will be times where i will get especially on the parish there was a lot of times where i got very passionate and very serious about like a camera angle or a shot right now i am not a cinematographer i'm not a director of photography that is not my role like i i don't know a lot about it in this film i knew key shots that i was like i want this i want this but like 95% of the time, the reason I work with the same cinematographer and everything I do is because he knows his shit. He's a cinematographer. Yeah. He understands it. So like, and it'll be, the funniest is when I do something that where I do want to break rules or do something a little bit different. And I, I have to talk him around to it. That's <laughs> fun. Those are my favorite moments because it can be such an interesting conversation to get him out of the like, no, but you can't do that. That's And then like when he comes around to it, it's like, Ah, narratively, I now understand exactly where. Because again, there's value in not knowing the art form as well. Like, yeah, absolutely. Can... Like, it's called beginner's mind. Yes, yeah. it's it's approaching something without all of the preconceptions about how it needs to be. And so, the more expert you are in a given craft, the the more almost the more baggage you might you might have in terms of no it, it like this is the way it's always been done this is the way i practiced it a million times yes and and so to i think that is one of the the gifts or the blessings that i kind of carry in as some even though i've been in print publishing for a, a long time yeah. if you count all of the magazines you know because the, the largest chunk of my career is is working for for magazines and yeah. so obviously there's a print publishing component to that um but book publishing is a totally different game as well. Yeah. So I'm coming in as a, a bit of a noob. I'm like, how do books get into bookstores? And I'm like looking in Google, like, <laughs> yeah. how do books, you know, typing it, like, how do books get into bookstores? Like doing this basic stuff that I'm somebody who's been in book publishing for their whole lives is like, would just be like looking down, like <laughs> their glasses, you know, looking down the end of their nose at me, like, you are such a fucking noob. But, uh, but like it's a gift in a way as well because i come in and and for me like i made a decision okay we're not going at least for now we're not going to be available in bookstores yeah because i think that's just a huge waste of resources yeah. and it's you know it's it's just expensive and a lot of times you end up you'll ship a in bunch death. of books out on on trucks and you're like you'll go into debt to like yeah. put all these books in bookstores and then they don't sell because your audience isn't like walking around physical bookstores. They're playing video games at home. Yeah. And so they don't even see your book and then they get, so that person doesn't sell your book and then they put it on another truck to send it back to you. And then you and owe for it, even though it's sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah. I know, like the whole thing, I was just, I just had this, very, reality, this realization, yeah. It's very similar to, to film distribution. It's crazy, they are very similar industries hmm. in a lot of ways because it's the same reason why i didn't go physical with the parish like when the distributor was like do you want us to get this into walmart and Redbox and stuff and i'm like no because i've heard all the horror stories of people with eighty thousand units sitting in a warehouse in vermont or something oh, uh, that cost them you know like they're like over this is know. like the et cartridges getting buried <laughs> in a desert in new mexico <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and it's like i'd much rather just if somebody wants to buy it they can buy it digitally and we're looking at doing exactly what you're doing, which is down the line, doing a high value collector's edition. Perfect. I you know, it. yeah. Um, yeah. To me, For the, the people pe who really love it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Cause I just, like you say, there's, I think we are moving away. I, I don't think, I don't think we're moving away from physical media, but I think we're moving away in a lot of ways from conventional physical media that we had known through the vast majority of mine and your lives, like growing up, like we always yeah. went to the, the big store and bought the games in the game shop and blah, blah, blah. But I think now, yeah, because we are hitting a point where creators can talk directly to consumers and then high value items are kind of your way of championing the things you love. Even if, I mean, yeah. I think I own The Last of Us twice. I own the digital collector's edition and I own the, 
the physical you know blue collector's edition yeah. because it's like i i want to do everything i can to support it you know even though if they don't need my support they're going to sell bazillion copies regardless um but it just becomes this kind of yeah we we do it like because we care about as you said exactly uh, exactly yeah the whole thing we're like like I feel like I would be doing Naughty Dog dirty if I didn't buy two copies <laughs> of The Last of Us, which is bullshit. <laughs> dirty dogging sounds like some kind of like unspeakable. Like we shouldn't Google that. Uh, no uh, that term, but <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, yeah, start the conversation with it. Um, it, it, it I, I totally, I love what you're saying. I love what you're saying. I think this is like, such. That is, is that's love. Like. I think this has been a great conversation. I think it's going to help a lot of people because I do think that we are all, a lot of, especially anyone who's creative, I think is going to get something from this conversation because yeah, like I've related so much to hearing everything you said. Like it's, it's really been exactly what I've experienced since the last time we chatted. It feels like even though our careers have gone on very different tra trajectories, we've kind of arrived at such a similar place. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I think that's why we hit it off. I think, you know, I think a lot of the people that I have had instant, like, friend, like, inst almost like instant friendship, like, connections with, they're just, they're people who are on the same wavelength that you can just tell this person, like, is, is the genuine person who cares, who cares about people, who cares about art, who cares about creativity, and those are my people. And and so I think it's just a great, great example of you know, of two people just having like the same, I don't know, like whatever the little force field around us, <laughs> you know, of the things we love and the things we care about. So it's not surprising to me to hear that like we have that much in common because I always I always kind of sensed that we did and yeah, I didn't same. know it for for sure. But this is just a verification that like all the all the the reason I respected like and sort of thought you were a great dude um I was like oh yeah that's that's just cause, same it's know, a real reaffirmation like a person who cares about the <laughs> yeah um, who cares I, about quality you know quality art and, and all the rest yeah, yeah well, I have this fear Jason that if, if I don't stop this I'm gonna keep talking to you forever because we definitely have so much <laughs> in common and uh hey yeah. if joe if joe rogan can have a three and a half hour conversation <laughs> with john ronson or you know, somebody else to the point where they're like literally they have to take a bathroom break in the middle of it because they've been talking for so long and then i'm impressed so, this, actually <laughs> yeah i know i i'm glad you didn't drink uh like a giant cup of coffee or something right before the uh, <laughs> <laughs> but then that's probably why you're like, okay, we need to wrap it up because I'm literally no, I'm, going I'm to. Uh, uh, but no, but, uh, but no, I like we sh we should we should also be respectful of like anybody who's come along this far yeah. um, and actually listen to us. Like this is the conversation we would have had in the pub. I think if exactly. uh, if we weren't locked away in our like I'm in my little you know office you know home office up here uh, in South Dublin and. And you're over there but uh yeah. you know it's but i feel like there are people out there who will <laughs> who will in, enjoy us obsessing over some of the same things that they, that they enjoy I, I hope anyway i definitely believe so I, I i really do um and also um like i i first of all want to say that i'm super grateful and gracious of you taking the time to to hop on and chat to me i know as you said like you as you said we're locked away and all the rest of it but still you are still a busy dude you have a podcast you have a family you have a book publishing company and so for you to take three hours out of your day to hop on and chat to me about and nerd out about stuff uh <laughs> makes me very happy uh, and as you said mics are not this would have been what what you've seen here is kind of what we would have as you said we this is what we would have done regardless of mics being on or not uh, well, it's, it's been the highlight of it's been the highlight of my day honestly so thank you thank you, thank you so much for the like just the enjo enjoying enjoyable scintillating conversation and uh for yeah for just being the the guy that you are and and bringing your your passion and your love into every single thing you do uh whether it's filmmaking or streaming or <laughs> yeah so i'm a, i'm a fan of yours and so i'm very happy to like to have three hours uh, i'm i feel like the lucky one in that equation so thanks thanks for having me on thank you very much uh, as i say the the catholic guilt brought up irish boy in me 
who can't handle any kind of compliment is just like flagellating myself in my mind at the moment. <laughs> uh, That's right. Well, you're you're going to play Dark. You're going to play Dark Souls like tomorrow on stream. So you yeah. can you can let the game do the flagellating for you. <laughs> yeah, but no, I just get I, the yeah. flame whip in the game. Uh, you know, the chaos whip or whatever it's called, and uh, you give yourself some fiery like Dimsdale. Arthur Dimsdale lashes to the back. Uh, oh, throwing man. some like nerdy I, literary references. <laughs> I am excited uh, to to dip in, back into that world, but I'm glad that I got to ha kind of set myself up for a return to that world with a chat, long chat with yourself about everything to do with it. So, Jason, thank you so much, uh, guys. Please, please head over and check out uh, the website for Tune and Fairweather. It would. If you are a fan of the Soul series, I cannot recommend it enough. Seriously, like, uh, there, there's so many beautiful items. I want to buy them all. When I saw the black and white variants of the books, I was like, shit, I want both of these because they're both gorgeous. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I strongly, and I'm not even, as I say, as of right now, I would not consider myself a Dark Souls fan. And just looking at the books, I was like, yeah, but look at them. They're gorgeous. I want to just stick them on a shelf and show them off. But now that I'm getting back into the game, it's much more of a reason. Um, but guys, check out Tune and Fairweather. Uh, all the links will be in the description to go and do so. Um, thank Jason for, for taking the time to be here. And uh, yeah, as always, I'll close this out with what I say at the end of everything, which is let's survive together and peace out. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Jason. Absolutely. You're surviving pretty well. We, we were, both, uh, we're both still kicking, so...